All right. Welcome well, back from lunch uh, or your breakfast or whatever you did. Remember, we're going around the world with this. Uh, this is the uh, next session for the ISS R&D conference technical sessions. And this session is cell biology and gene expression. We've got five presenters and our session chair is John Love. John is an ISS research funding and integration scientist at NASA at JSC. Now, before we get started, I want to remind everybody that we do have a Q&A option. You can go down to the bottom of your screen, click on the Q&A little icon there, type in your question, and then uh, that's all you have to do. Please, if you can, direct your questions to a specific panelist. It helps us understand who we need to address. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to play the five minute executive summaries on the five uh, different presentations that we have this time. So Sarah, let's go ahead and start the presentations. We investigated the effect of microgravity on immunological senescence and how that impacts tissue stem cells and regeneration. So as background, um, tumor cells are effector memory RNA positive T cells, which show an exhausted and senescent phenotype. And they are involved um, in tissue regeneration, like for example, bone regeneration. Mice with bone fracture usually are able to heal that bone fracture when they don't have tumor cells within 21 days, as you can see here on that picture. However, when the mice are transferred tumor cells, then you see that the bone fracture is not healing at all, indicating that the presence of tumor cells affects the bone repair stem cells. The hypothesis was that microgravity increases the aging of immune cells, meaning that we would demonstrate an increase of tumor cells. And the background of the hypothesis is that the microgravity mimics biological processes that occur during aging in humans. You see here flow cytometry data when we put PPMCs on tissue chips into simulated microgravity in red versus the 1G control, so the normal lab conditions. And you see in red that in simulated microgravity, the phenotype of tumor cells significantly increases up to 60%. And this was within only 72 hours. Whereas at 1G, the tumor cell population stayed below 20% as expected. We confirmed those data by sending chips containing human PBMCs to space. And you see here RNA sequencing data for G that is the ground control versus F that all, those are the flight samples and you see that three genes click three PTGDR2 and PTGER2 are upregulated significantly during space flight and this upregulation shows you that there is an activation of chronic T cells which may contribute to the development of features of replicative senescence like in aging of immune cells. So we then wanted to understand if the tumor cell population that increases in space will also impact our body-owned stem cells. And therefore, we co-cultured them on tissue chips and investigated the effect of tumor cells on stem cells, on their proliferation, migration, differentiation capacity. You see here movies from mesenchymal stroma cells or MSCs. And they are important, for example, for wound healing. On the left side, you see the MSCs not migrating into the scratch at all when they were co-cultured with tumor cells. And on right, you see the blue group, which is the 1G, the normal lab control, and you see that the scratch is covered. The viability in both experiments was the same. However, the function of the mesenchymal stroma cells was significantly impaired by tumor cells. We confirmed those data um, by sending tissue chips to space where we co-cultured the PBMCs with the MSCs. And you see an example on top for CA9, for example, that is usually 
not changing between ground and flight for PBMCs, but you see a significant increase in the MSC population, and that's important, meaning that the wound healing of those MSCs and the cell survival and differentiation is actually increased in space. However, in the middle, you see when those cells are co-cultured with the PPMCs, and we know that PPMCs are differentiating into tumor cells, you see that that pro-wound healing effect of MSCs um, doesn't happen, doesn't occur anymore. And on the bottom, you see the data for serpin B2, and serpin B2 overexpression inhibits the cell proliferation, invasion, migration of stem cells. And you see PPMCs are not really showing any differences of that gene. MSCs usually in space are downregulating that gene, confirming that they are more proliferative. However, when they are co-cultured with PPMCs, which turn into um, tumor cells, then you see that this downregulation is not happening anymore. And in fact, there is an upregulation of the gene, inhibiting the cell proliferation migration capacity of those MSCs and confirming the simulated microgravity data I have shown you before. So I want to thank the whole team. Good afternoon. This is Carolina Marin de Sakova, and I'm here to present our work on comparative genomics to detect novel transposon-driven gene expression changes in model animals living on the International Space Station. Adaptation to new stressful environments, such as spaceflight, causes physiological, cellular, and molecular changes, as well as epigenetic changes, which could lead to activation or silencing of many genes and other genetic elements, for instance, transposons. Transposons are one of the most powerful forces driving variation in organisms through insertional mutagenesis, non-homologous recombination of genes, cis-regulation of gene expression. They have a confirmed functional roles in biology, such as transposon-driven gene expression, transposon-derived functional non-coding RNAs, and they have a role in stiffness and regeneration. To address our hypothesis that stress from adaptation to spaceflight elevates expression of specific transposons and alters gene re networks, we created a novel bioinformatics pipeline known as T-TESA Transcript and Transposon Signature Analysis. Astonishingly, some transposons were induced up to 250 times increase after six days in the International Space Station. Notably, the most differentially expressed transposons were long terminal repeat transposons, shown in the green dots, which resemble retroviruses and can propagate readily within the genome because they encode their own reverse transcriptase. Our preliminary data using our T-TESA bioinformatics pipeline with Madaka fish living on the International Space Station revealed gene expression changes that implicate adaptation to space alters multiple systems and biological processes including energy balance, lipid metabolism, fertility, by changes in steroid hormone production, among many others. And the significant gene ontology terms are highlighted in color. In fact, our preliminary data also collaborates previous work that space flight down regulates gene networks for muscle activity and growth. Likewise, 
There are changes in transposon expression in Drosophila during spaceflight, albeit at a lower scale than Medaka. Transposons whose expression is significantly different are shown in red. Surprisingly, spaceflight did not affect as many systems in Drosophila as it did in Madaka. However, we can see that between two model organisms there are similarities such as upregulation of immune system genes which may be indicative of a response to transposon activation as well as a downregulation of growth related genes which again has been observed in other experiments. Transposons change expression in space environment. Different species have different transposon expression responses which may underlie gene expression changes during adaptation to spaceflight. My name is Afshin Beheshti. I'm currently a principal investigator at KBR NASA Ames Research Center. In addition, I'm also a bioinformatician at G NASA's Gene Lab a program at NASA Ames Research Center. And also, I'm a visiting researcher at Broad Institute. Today, I'll be discussing how you can use NASA Gene Lab platform to be utilized to predict space radiation biological response as a function of dose. And to do this, we're combining not only the experiments and data sets that were done on the ISS, International Space Station, but also from the simulated uh, space ground studies that are done at places like Brookhaven National Lab. So the main focus of this study is going to be on space radiation. And as you, most of you know here, uh, space radiation is comp comprised of galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events is another event which is one high acute dose of protons at different energies uh, being hit when you're in deep space. Of course, when you're at low Earth orbit, you're protected by the Van Allen belt, but then in deep space, you're not. As you can see here, a trip to Mars and an equivalent to other kind of radiation you might experience is, uh, you know, the hundreds of hundred thousand fold differences that you can see occurring. So the main question is, how do we relate deep space radiation experiments, which we have no samples to actually gather data from, to the low Earth orbits and make predictions of biological response that is occurring? To do this, we look at omics data that's available in GeneLab. So we take the GeneLab omics data sets that are there and then utilize this for this project that we're about to show. And a summary of this work really quickly is that, you know, there's simulated ground studies that are done with space radiation done at Brookhaven National Lab at the NES, at NSRL. And then there's also, of course, samples that are flown to the ISS and the, and the older samples that were done, experiments that were done on the space shuttle and within these are comprised of different tissues that were collected from mice that are summarized here and then also in vitro experiments that were done in cells for human cells as you see here and then from the ground experiments we took basically the different ions from proton iron and silicon that are available on gene lab and we then we also took what we we're calling here the galactic cosmic ray or gcr experiments done in the iss and one important point as i brought up before is that on the ISS is that low Earth orbit, which is not experiencing the deep full impact of the galactic cosmic rays that you see at deep space radiation. So the overall, high overall view of what we did here is first looked at RNA-seq data to look at mutation rates that might occur or error rates in the chromosome. From there, we saw the interesting impact happening at these low dosages in the mice, that, which warrants future studies. But the main impact of this paper is looking at how to correlate these different omics platforms and data sets using pathway analysis tools and then using different statistical tools to make modeling predictions of how different biological response might happen as a function of dose. And the paper we, is available here that uh, we published earlier this year. And one brief example we say after we've done our analysis, show you one th pathway that popped up was mitochondrial pathways. What's interesting here, we have a paper currently under review that is agreeing with what is and the overall conclusions of these papers of this paper is that we might be able to use these techniques to actually use relate 
what's down in the simulated studies that are down, done on Earth for space radiation to actual uh, low Earth orbit space radiation experiments that are done. And this can be used as a high level way to determine countermeasures and potential targets to use for monitoring health risks. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Swanson and I work with Simon Gilroy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'd like to tell you about a new fluorescence imager for the International Space Station called Spectrum. Spectrum is a dissecting level magnification fluorescent microscope designed and built for use on the ISS to image petri plate biology. This is a custom instrument able to operate in microgravity using power and cooling resources on station. An astronaut can insert up to four petri plates into a carousel inside the spectrum and then close the door. The experiment is then run remotely from Kennedy Space Center. Spectrum has a range of excitation wavelengths, GFP and RFP are shown here, allowing multiple probes to be imaged in one sample. The carousel rotates the petri plates in succession to the position for imaging. The chamber is a controlled environment with a CO2 scrubber, thermoregulation, and grow lights above the petri plates to support photosynthetic growth. This environment allows multiple days of imaging while the sample grows in microgravity. Here's a view of the ELS, the excitation light source, which is a series of LEDs arranged in a rosette. There are a number of emission filters available, which you can mix and match with different excitation wavelengths. The ELS and emission filters can be swapped by an astronaut, so it is possible for the researcher to customize these components. The spectrum is also capable of collecting a kind of a bright field image using, it's called the bare RGB filters. The three monochrome images are then pseudocolored RGB and combined to form one image. This is a good view of the ELS inside the chamber and the carousel which has been removed out of the chamber. So our lab was fortunate to have the opportunity last year at Kennedy Space Center to team up with the engineers building Spectrum. We ran an extended 10-day test in the Spectrum flight unit using plant and yeast samples. Here's an RGB image of a petri plate containing our plant seedlings. You can see a slight reflection of the ELS in the lid of the petri plate. Spectrum has an Illumis camera with 71 megapixels and the Canon lens allows the entire petri plate to be captured at once. It is possible to crop the image to a few plants and still have a very high resolution image. Here we're looking at the fluorescence signal from the same plants. We've got two lines growing on this plate. GCAMP is a fluorescent calcium indicator which has a strong signal in the GFP channel and as expected nothing in the RFP channel. On the other hand, ZAT contains both GFP and M-cherry, which is visible in the RFP channel. There are a number of ways to optimize brightness in spectrum images. This includes the excitation intensity, exposure time, and f-stop. So here I've put together a time course of images from our G-Camp plant. So it is possible to see changes in different tissues over time. This is a pseudocolored movie showing low calcium as cool blue and higher calcium as colored hot yellow. If you look closely, there's a calcium transient in the cotyledon of the smaller plant. This change in fluorescence intensity can be plotted over time to quantify the change. I'm currently developing ImageJ scripts to more easily analyze changes over time in different regions of interest. Finally, I want to let you know that Spectrum was launched to the ISS last year and installed this past June. Our lab is one of three in an international team of scientists who will send PG plates to the ISS for the first on-orbit biological experiment called Spectrum 001. I hope to 
be able to tell you the results perhaps next year. Hi, my name is Dr. Katie Martin. I represent the Genes in Space program, and today I'm going to be sharing with you a few initiatives that we are spearheading to bring student-driven ISS research into the K-12 class. Both initiatives fall under the Genes in Space umbrella. Genes in Space is an outreach initiative that takes the form of a competition. We Each year we ask students in middle and high school to propose DNA analysis experiments that solve pressing problems faced by space travelers. Each year we select one winning experiment to launch to the ISS where it's carried out by astronauts. Our program was founded in 2015 and since then we've launched six student investigations to the ISS with an additional two in development for launch later this year or early next. Our student winners have been responsible for some sophisticated molecular biology work aboard the ISS, from uh, understanding the underpinnings of the immune deficiencies faced by astronauts to exploring the molecular underpinnings of the premature aging that astronauts face, all the way up to studying DNA damage and repair using cutting edge molecular techniques, including CRISPR DNA editing technology. But our winners are just the tip of the iceberg. Each year we receive hundreds of submissions from thousands of students. And over the five years our program has been in existence, we've engaged more than 6,400 students in designing research to be executed aboard the ISS. Now we're a STEM outreach program and as such our primary goal is to engage students in science and engineering. We found that the most effective tool we can wield to do so is our own program alumni. It seems to be uniquely inspiring to students when they can look at the minds behind our groundbreaking ISS research investigations and they see students who look like themselves. And so today I'm going to be sharing two initiatives with you that aim to close this loop between our program alumni, their groundbreaking research, and K-12 classrooms where those same students were nurtured uh, and where their ideas were born, with the ultimate goal of inspiring the next wave of innovators and researchers. The two initiatives I'll share with you are our Lab in a Box program, which aims to bring the tools of the ISS into K-12 classrooms on Earth, and our DNA editing lab, um, in which students and teachers can replicate the 2018 winning Genes in Space experiment in their own classrooms. Through our Lab in a Box program, teachers can borrow free two-week loans of the same biotechnology astronauts use aboard the ISS to execute winning genes in space experiments. Teachers who participate in this program receive not only a classroom set of biotechnology hardware, but also the curriculum and support resources they need to carry out a scientific investigation using those tools. Lab in a Box has been around since 2017, and in, in its three years, we've reached more than 4,000 students through 67 loans shipped across 30 states. Now, unlike Lab in a Box, the second initiative I'll be sharing with you is more of a work in progress, but I'll be sharing uh, the direction that we're headed in and giving you an idea of what this will look like once it takes shape. This second initiative is our DNA editing lab, wherein students and teachers in their own classrooms can replicate the Genes in Space 2018 winning experiment. This experiment was developed by our Genes in Space 2018 winning team you see here, Rebecca, Michelle, Artie, and David from Minnesota. Their experiment focused on DNA damage and repair, which astronauts experience to a greater degree in outer space due to exposure to cosmic radiation. DNA damage can lead to genetic mutations, which can ultimately lead to negative health effects, including cancer. In their winning investigation, the team elected to use CRISPR gene editing technology to inflict DNA damage in a targeted fashion. They carried this out in yeast, taking advantage of a system that produces a red or pink color change following the CRISPR edit, making for very easy visual verification of the success of the use of CRISPR. We're still determining how best to share this exciting work with K-12 classrooms, but one possibility I'll present in this presentation is the establishment of a virtual bioinformatics platform where we can share DNA sequencing data generated by this experiment. Um, this would put this data set in the hands of students all across the country for them to analyze and manipulate on their own. 
A second possibility is the creation of a hands-on lab kit that can be shipped to classrooms where teachers and students can actually carry out the very same work done aboard the ISS last year to complete this experiment. For more details on these initiatives, please see the full version of this talk or head to genesinspace.org. I'd like to close by thanking our sponsors for enabling this work. All right, so we've got some really interesting things going on in, in this area. We need to uh, remind everybody to put in your Q&As by going down and clicking on the Q&A on the bottom of your screen, typing in your question, and please try to direct it to one or more or two or more or three or more of the panelists, but just make sure you identify at least one panelist. And also, please uh, note we do not take cues and answers through the chat process. We're only doing the questions and answers through the question and answer port. And it looks like we've got about everybody up. Got another moment to wait, I think. And uh, all right, John. John Love is the chair for this session. John, you have all your panelists. Please introduce them and move ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you so much for joining us today at this session on uh, cell biology and uh, <clears throat> gene expression at the uh, first day for the technical sessions uh, of the ISS Research and Development Conference. We have an excellent panel uh, with us. I will introduce them individually. We have Professor Sonia uh, Schreffer from the University of California at San Francisco. We have Dr. Carolina Marine the the Ev Sikuba of the Bay Pines VA Healthcare System. We have Dr. Afshin Beheshti of KVR at NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, we have Professor Sarah Swanson from the University of Wisconsin Madison. And we have Dr. Katie Martin, who is the program lead for Genes in Space. So we'll get started with the pre submitted questions. Uh, we received uh, uh, one of them and it's directed to Dr. Beheshti. So I'll read that one. Um, can the gene database be used to investigate the effects of endosymbiont epigenomic effects? Uh, for example, Candida albicans effects on carbohydrate utilization? Yeah, I mean, uh, so gene lab it itself, yeah, thank, thanks for introducing the introduction. Thanks for having me speak here, but yeah, so so gene lab itself, um, is comprised of you know different data from in the full in my full presentation you could uh, when you go online you can see what I described gene lab a little bit and Sylvan Cost the project manager he he gave a nice talk I think last week of the first session on gene lab but within gene lab we have transcriptomic data which I focused on this on this work that I showed and we also have then proteomic data and we also have epigenetic data yeah methylation data that you could actually dive into so if you have any the, the novelty about gene lab is if you have any questions and any kind of ideas you just dive in and do the search find the methylation data epigenetic data and you could definitely answer that question that came up <laughs> I didn't look at that specifically but you know that's the beauty of omics data you could if you have any kind of creative input or ideas you can just dive right into it and tackle the idea so I hope I answered that question indirectly <laughs> great thank you so much uh, we have received a number of questions through the question and answer tool so we will go through those. Uh, and again, we are asking that they ideally be directed to a specific speaker, even though we might have some that are more generic. Uh, first question uh, is regarding spectrum. Uh, could samples other than Petri dishes be used, for instance, microscope slides? And which magnifications does it mount? And this one, uh, of course, is for uh, Professor Swanson. Great, thanks for the question. So um, certainly microscope slides can be used. The strength of this uh, capability for on station is actually imaging uh, live cells and live organisms. Um, so a, a, a microscope slide configuration is certainly possible, uh, but you'll have to think about how to keep your um, sample alive while it's being imaging imaged. Um, spectrum is also good because it minimizes the crew time. So you might think, oh, I can have the crew prepare my microscope slide and put it in, um, but uh, 
oftentimes the crew is not uh, a scientist a biologist. So um, it sort of is an advantage to design your experiments such to minimize the crew time. Um, so yeah, while microscope slides are possible, there's other aspects of the experimental design which may be a challenge. Excellent. Thank you for your answer. Uh, we have uh, a question that is actually directed to everyone, so I'll ask uh, each of the panelists uh, individually to provide uh, an answer. Uh, to all speakers, what were the most surprising and or important findings you obtained from your flight investigations? And why are they significant uh, for the layperson? We'll start with uh, Professor uh, uh, Schreppler. Yeah, thank you. And um, for us, the most surprising um, was that changes in the immune population can happen as early as 72 hours. So um, working with immune cells my whole life, I, we weren't expecting um, to see changes that fast. So that was very uh, interesting for us to see. And then for, um, I didn't catch your second part of the question. Um, the, the second part was to use uh, layman's la language, uh, not uh, high-level scientific uh, vocabulary. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, so for the 72 hours, maybe just one um, comment here as well. Um, so we feel that um, space flight, even if you're only a short time in space, uh, might have impact on your immune system and subsequently on the body on stem cells, um, thinking about wound healing, if you have small wounds in space, et cetera. So I think that was a surprising uh, result for us to, to find. And um, we still look into it if we can prevent it or reverse it. But that is, those are open questions. Great. Um, so let's go uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Marine V. F. Sikova, uh, that uh, same questions like about any significant uh, findings that you can uh, uh, share with us from your research. Yes, uh, that other elements of the of the genome, um, regardless if it's from a microorganism to a um, human, that non-genetic elements such as transposons, which can control, regulate, and alter gene networks. Uh, can be up to 500 fold uh, changes in their expression and which would lead to a thousands of fold changes and transposons can initiate other gene activity and on earth studies it can initiate different types of cancer for example so if these somehow either radiation or microgravity alter transposons, this may be another molecular or gen uh, genetic mechanism for gene networks and um, predisposition for health and disease in the space environment. Great. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, let's go with Dr. Beheshti, uh, same question. Uh, any significant uh, uh, highlights uh, related to your research findings that you would like to, to share today in lay terms? Sure. Yeah, I think the, the, the most surprising part of the work was that in an unbiased way, we were able to correlate pretty well how um, the low Earth orbit responses to radiation uh, uh, would be related to deep space. So we could find trends and we could find um, in, in, in biological response is a function of dose. So it could be used, this the technique I presented could be used as a way to possibly um, start realizing biological impact that can happen in deep space that right now is not possible with any kind of experiments as we know. So I think it's a kind of a tool that could eventually evolve too for people who have more advanced AI machine learning techniques, they could actually come along and say, hey, we could modify this to be more sophisticated than my simple approach too. So so that's the, that's the biggest, I think, takeaway from my, my presentation. Excellent. Uh, let's go now with uh, Professor Swanson. Uh, any uh, comments based on your experience with spaceflight experiments, uh, some highlights you'd like to share? Right. Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, so, of course, with the spectrum, we haven't had a chance to test it on orbit yet. That's coming up soon. I spent last weekend preparing our samples for flight on NG14. So that's coming up. 
uh, at the end of the month. So um, I'll be able to tell you more about that hopefully next year. But um, in general, the ISS is just incredible resource for, uh, for biologists to be able to understand and discover aspects of how their favorite organism grows in microgravity. So biology has evolved at 1G here on Earth, put them in a situation where there's no gravity and they have to figure it out. And the way they do that is use the toolbox that they've developed on Earth. And that toolbox is differences in gene expression. Um, in the lab in which I work, Simon Gilroy, we've done a lot of work um, looking at differences in gene expression in plants grown in space on the ISS versus the ground. Um, and in general, one of the, the aspects of the toolbox is that they use is response to um, hypoxia and response to other stresses. So they upregulate uh, their genes in response uh, to the, the 1G environment um, using the tools that they've developed on the ground, basically. And it's quite fascinating to have this opportunity to be able to discover these differences and maybe help understand better how plants grow on Earth. Excellent. And uh, let's ask uh, Dr. Martin uh, the same question. Any highlights you'd like to share from your ISS uh, experience? Uh, or the lay community? Yeah, um, I think the highlights for us, we, we, get, we get involved in a lot of proof of concept work. So our, the first student to win genes in space uh, was responsible for the experiment that ended up being the first successful use of PCR technology in space. Most recently, the experiment we launched was the first use of CRISPR in space. Um, and so a lot of what we've been doing is um, taking the, the extensive toolkit we have in an earth microbiology, uh, not microbiology, molecular biology lab and starting to send it bit by bit up to the ISS. And I think the pleasant surprise for us has been how much of it works beautifully on the ISS, despite all the differences there. And despite how there, you know, a lot of that technology relies on things that you'd expect to be different in space versus on earth. Um, we were kind of tangentially involved in some of the early DNA sequencing work and all the microfluidics involved in using the, the sequencer that we used. You can imagine that that would be different, but yet we got nice results with it. So that's been really fun to kind of um, bit by bit kind of kind of advance that and see that it, it, it works the same in, in spaces on Earth. Fantastic. Thanks again. Let's go through the rest of the questions that have been submitted again through the tool. Uh, this one is for spectrum. Can spectrum be used for organisms beside plants? What kind of resolution does the camera have? Oh, absolutely. So um, you can think of spectrum as a dissecting microscope. Um, it's a uh, fluorescence uh, imager. Um, but any kind of sample that might work well on Earth uh, using a dissecting microscope will probably also work well in spectrum. Um, Indeed, it's possible to look at other types of organisms. Uh, we're also sending yeast up, so single cells uh, assessing colonies of yeast and how they grow um, and how their fluorescence changes over time. Um, in addition to other small organisms that grow well in a petri plate, um, the temperature in spectrum can be set up to um, from, I think it's from 18 to 37 degrees. Uh, so you can't, degrees C. So it's possible to set it up so that it's warm enough to grow um, perhaps animal cell lines. Um, and of course, plants and other organisms. Um, the camera itself is kind of amazing. Uh, it's an Illumis camera and it's got 71 megapixels. Uh, basically each image is 10,000 pixels by I think 7,000. So you got a lot of pixels there, uh, but it's required so that you can see the whole petri plate in one shot. Um, and then you can actually crop down and adjust subregions of that um, petri plate and get a very high resolution image. Um, I think the, the, um, the uh, pixels themselves are 13 micron resolution. Um, so you're, it's, yeah, it's an outstanding camera. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, another question uh, regarding spectrum, how do you control condensation in the, in the petri dish from fogging the images? Oh, um, yeah, if you, if you saw the extended briefing, there's more information there, but um, as a, a quick summary, so um, most petri plate biology is happiest with the lid on. So you wanna keep your sample happy while you're being while you're uh, doing microscopy. You don't want it to get stressed out because you might be imaging an artifact mm -hmm. uh, of stressed out 
uh, organism. But um, so that would be the easiest solution is to just take the lid off. Um, but that's not really possible here. So we're working with the lid and oftentimes the um, moisture in the petri plate condenses on the lid due to a, a temp temperature differential. Uh, and that moisture is, can make imaging quite challenging. So each droplet acts as a little tiny lens that can occlude what you're trying to see. Um, so the uh, solution that the spectrum engineering team came up with is to impose a thermal gradient. So the back of the petri plate where the sample and the gel is, is just slightly warmer, about half degree warmer than the lid. And this uh, not only prevents condensate from forming, but also can clear existing condensate because oftentimes petri plates are sent to station um, cold, refrigerated, so that the organisms are um, quiescent until we can, we can start the experiment in the spectrum. And that can cause a lot of condensate too. So yeah, that's a good question. Great. Uh, this next question, I believe that it uh, relates to the genes in space uh, presentation for Dr. Martin. How do you design the environment uh, for an experiment and a classroom that uh, uh, will be different uh, from the one in real space? That's a good question. Um, yeah, they, they seem like really different places, right? But actually they have more in common than you might think. Um, both are really different from the molecular biology labs you might find at a university or an industry. Um, they have some of the same limitations in common. So actually adapting this experiment from the ISS to the classroom takes less than you might think, um, though certainly there are plenty of adaptations that, that we'll need to make in terms of getting the materials to classrooms safely. Um, but in terms of the doing of the actual experiment, a lot of it, the, the methods are really the same um, that they use in the ISS versus on Earth. It involves like culturing yeast, growing up yeast, and then sampling those yeast and, and doing uh, molecular analyses of them. And all those things are capabilities that, in the same way the ISS has kind of brick by brick built its molecular biology lab, classrooms have been doing the same thing. Um, and so I guess the short answer is it, it takes less of adaptation than, than you might think. Great. Um, the, uh, an, a, another question for uh, Spectrum, uh, have other small plants that are easy to phenotype and grow in plates ended up in Spectrum other than Arabidopsis? For instance, duckweeds, algae, are there ch challenges you've overcome in Arabidopsis that will translate to new species? Uh, Professor Swanson? Yeah, um, certainly if he can grow it on a petri plate, you can likely have it in spectrum for imaging. Um, I know duckweeds is a very tiny um, organism. It's an aquatic organism. I'm not sure if it grows on the surface of a, a nutrient gel. Uh, if it does, that would be great. Um, things that are moving um, may be a challenge. So uh, like with all microscopy, the, the camera has an exposure time. So you have to kind of balance the type of um, yeah, uh, emission, the fluorescence intensity uh, of your sample to the capabilities of the system. And typically uh, for experiments that are gonna be on station, you get to do a ground test first to make sure your biology is actually gonna work. And there is a ground mm -hmm. unit at Kennedy Space Center. Um, so in the process of working out the details of your particular organism, you'll have a, the chance to actually test it on the ground before your experiment goes up. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, the next question I will ask to, to everyone, uh, and it has two parts. Uh, what sort of reactions do your colleagues have when you mention that you do this sort of research in space? And have any of your students altered career plans towards space research as a result? Uh, let's start with uh, Professor uh, Thank you. Um, we do have a space medicine consortium at UCSF for the medical students, so some of them really have the interest to go into that space, um, but it's like in the first semester, so um, we are basically following those students, we're in contact with them, they come in summer into the lab to us, um, but um, it's too early to say if really the career um, path changed for them. It looks like because they show that uh, interest, um, but but it's a little bit too early to say that. And the other, what sort of reactions do your colleagues have when you mention that you do this sort of research in space? The first reaction is always um, asking 
what are you doing? Um, why do you send mice or cells into space? Um, but uh, we also get, of course, a lot of attraction for the, from the student side. So they basically find our lab because of our space flight studies. And then we tell them on top what we also do with stem cell biology and those kind of things. So for the students, it's always like a magnet. They come and um, it's always, always the first they say in an interview if they want to come to the lab. For the colleagues, it's always, oh, so that is only your fun project and what do you do in serious life? So then you have to educate them how really serious that research is and that you can really learn um, from those experiments and then transfer the knowledge to earth and uh, really change also patients' medicine. So that's um, an educational part there for some of the colleagues. Excellent. Um, let's go now uh, with Dr. Marine de Evsikova. Uh, uh, what sort of reactions do your colleagues have when you mention that you do this sort of research in space and have any of your students altered career plans towards space research as a result? I will say it's the best attention getter um, to get, um, you know, in a room. Uh, and before COVID, when we were meeting in person, it was a great thing to bring up when the faculty would come together for um, coffee chats. And it definitely piques everyone's curiosity. And I have questions ranging from what kind of organisms are on the ISS. They didn't know organisms often were on the ISS and what and are their laboratory capabilities of the ISS. So much of the time I'm actually um, presenting um, information about the different capabilities. And actually I'm glad to have met Sarah because I had read so much about Spectrum and I had described it um, to my colleagues um, at both through the VA and through the University of South Florida um, who were just floored that they are working um, laboratories on the ISS. And I want to make note that I'm at the College of Medicine, so most of the physicians are unaware, as well as the biologists. So it's really opened up um, a lot of possibilities and a lot of really interesting discussions about how you separate out radiation and microgravity and um, other extreme environments and when conducting experiments on the space station. As for students, um, yes, actually a few students have altered their career plans. I now have had um, two students who are entering medical school with the goal to become some of the first um, space physicians. And they both are actively looking for internships um, uh, at NASA or NASA related laboratories, but both have been um, admitted to medical school. So they're keeping the connections with the lab. They want to keep analyzing some of the bioinformatics and the gene expression data with, um, with us while they're in medical school and to look at if, um, what are any health risks um, to uh, both you know, space tourism, so short-term and longer-term um, effects for more space travel and, um, and exploration. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, let's ask the same questions to uh, uh, Dr. Beheshti. Uh, reactions from your colleagues when you mentioned that you do this sort of research in space and have any of your students altered career plans towards space research? Yeah, so I guess most of my colleagues where I work with NASA, so <laughs> they're, they're very complacent there. So they're very uh, agreeing with the research. But outside of that, when I'm at uh, Broad Institute, I have an appointment there. A lot of them are as typical, t as same reactions as the as Sonia and and, and the others have mentioned, where they they very much are intrigued by it and, and have no clue what happens in space biology or in space. So you'd have to. It's more of an education process. And once they learn, they get they get pretty excited, but then they tend not to focus away from their own you know, clinical type research, but start considering ways to maybe outside of that with me and you know figure out ways. And the same with the students. Some of the graduate students that I interact with, they, they they try to find ways to be working on these projects, but they're like a lot of times in, inhibited by you know their their goals of where the institution they're at. For example, bro, they they don't know about space biology, they don't work on that. But once they hear about it, they try to figure out ways to you know incorporate these kind of research into it. So right. it's, 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 uh, let's move uh, uh, quickly to Professor Swanson. Same question. Yeah, thank you. So 
Uh, of course, space research is incredibly engaging and students, it's like, like it was just said, it's a magnet. Um, but it's also great. So similar, like the way the, the spectrum experiment, for example, is a collaboration between biologists and engineering. And in our lab at Wisconsin, um, we also have that collaboration going with um, the engineering department, uh, uh, Professor Simon Gilroy, whom I work for, um, along with a postdoc in the lab, uh, Dr. Barker, who's actually giving a talk later today in another session, if you're interested. Um, they uh, provide an astrobotany engineering class uh, in which we ask the students, please design this hardware for us to help study plants in space. And it's always, they're quite creative and it's fun to work with them and it's quite interesting to see what they come up with. Um, and the best solutions we take forward to help us in our um, botany research in microgravity. Um, so yeah, it's a great opportunity for students. And again, it's quite engaging. Um, and yeah, there's always possibilities for a collaboration between um, engineers and biologists. Um, and as for students, Simon had a, a, a student. Her name is Dr. Joya Massa. She may sound familiar because she yeah. is now a um, NASA project scientist for the Veggie at Kennedy Space Center. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if uh, you know anything can happen if you're if you're mm -hmm. interested in biology um, and join a lab that encourages that sort of uh, direction of your thinking. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Martin uh, if she has uh, any uh, comments about how uh, people react uh, in relation to communicating uh, that she works with uh, space investigations as well as impacts to students. Of course, your program is focused on that. Yeah, I'll echo the others in terms of colleagues' reactions. It's very similar. There's a phase one that's like, I would say is dazzled and jealous. And then phase two is more like, wait, but what is the ISS? And then there's lots of questions about what actually is done aboard the ISS. Um, in terms of student engagement, my students, the ones I know best are the students who win um, our competition or who are finalists in our competition. And it probably won't surprise you to find out that many of them, after having a taste of doing IS research on the ISS through a program, they are into it and they, they want to pursue that as, as their career. I'd say um, our first two alumni, I think, are really seriously considering that as a career option. Um, our student, one of the students who won last year in 2019 is, is also interested in space medicine. And I think he, he was going the MD track and then after his experience with genes in space is now wanting to specialize more in, in space physiology. So it does, with our alumni, it definitely leaves a strong mark and kind of drives them into that profession. Excellent. Let's proceed with the rest of the questions that we have received. This one is actually for genes in space. Uh, the genes in space program is outstanding uh, as, it, as, as is an educational tool. Uh, are there any findings from genes in space that have produced unique or intriguing, intriguing or scientifically significant uh, findings at a professional level? Yeah, in addition to the student engagement, of course, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we've made some like real technical advancements in terms of proof of concept work for molecular biology in space. So. I mentioned a few minutes ago that our first winner was responsible for the first PCR experiment in space. Hadn't been done before and, and there was uncertainty about how it would work, how it might be different. Um, and so she was able to, actually able to publish that as a first author in a peer review journal, not like a student oriented peer review journal, but like a, it was um, a NPJ microgravity. So one that professional researchers publish in. Um, uh, and that's kind of the, the, the thrust of our work. A lot of it is proof of concept and doing pieces of the molecular biology workflow on the ISS and gradually over time kind of stringing those pieces together till we get to the point where we're doing full on investigations. Um, the last experiment we launched reached, came the closest to being a complete, I think it, it, you could say it was a complete molecular biology investigation. Sorry. So we launched yeast and they actually grew on the ISS mm -hmm. and then we used PCR um, to, to sequence a gene that, that we had manipulated. Uh, sorry, we used PCR to amplify and then uh, a sequencer to sequence a gene that we manipulated. So um, bit by bit, I think it's the technical advancements that our students are really driving and, and that kind of rate on a professional scale. Excellent. Um, now we have a question for Dr. Beheshti. 
Uh, how do you separate the effects of radiation from other effects experienced by organisms during space flight, such as zero gravity? Do you see an expression signature of radiation-induced DNA damage, for instance, upregulation of H2FAX histone? Yeah, so the analysis that I had done was trying to find out if it's tissue independent and organism independent. So in that sense, like see if there was kind of a universal response to space radiation in, in effect. And so, yeah, it, for the samples that are on the space station, you got the micro, microgravity component, but I'm hoping through the modeling, it seemed like to work, uh, we, we factors for space radiation uh, response. So then, yes, things like DNA damage, we do see it's on a pathway level, so we can't go to like specific genes like H2AX or specific DNA repair genes. So we're looking at the pathway level, and we do see like DNA repair pathways increase as, as a function of dose, as you would expect. Or things like um, uh, hypoxia would be increasing, and things like that. We, so we see internal controls, like you know that that we do expect to increase as an independent of an organism or dose or things like, or, or or tissues occur. So then if you want to know about the microgravity component to, to pull out, that should be something that I think someone could tackle in a, a creative way, but there's no really ground analogs except for uh, Marie Retro, Seward Rutkov have a partial gravity model where they could uh, have partial, uh, as a function of gravity, different percentage of gravity that they could calculate. But so that's a tougher question to know how to relate deep space microgravity components to moon, to the Mars, you know, things like that. So I think that's that, that'd be definitely interesting to look at. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a question uh, for Dr. Swanson. Uh, what kinds of forces on the samples are exerted by rotating the petri dishes? Could these forces skew the microgravity results? Yep, absolutely. Um, and so the carousel is actually is kind of a necessity because if you want more than n equals one petri plate. Um, you're, you're going to have to rotate it to in front of the camera. It's always, it's also possible to just have a single petri plate and then no rotation um, to minimize the possibility of, of this problem. But uh, again, there's a ground unit. So we're, we're uh, attenu uh, studying on the ground also with the same um, rate of rotation. Um, it is possible to slow down the speed of rotation. So this is another thing that you can customize. So if you suspect your samples are getting a force put on them by the rotation, you can hopefully minimize it. Um, turning it around is also a way to impose a um, partial gravity. So you might also think of a way to design an experiment for spectrum where you do want the carousel rotating and then stop it for imaging in order to study how your organism is responding to a partial gravity stimulus. So I think Excellent. all in all, the, ca the, the carousel rotation is a, can, you know, has a lot of potential for interesting experiments. Very good. Uh, we're down to a couple of minutes, I believe. We could go on for another hour or more. There's so, such great presentations. We'll entertain a last question submitted, uh, also for Dr. Swanson. If any of the astrobiology engineering lab uh, students uh, have developed ideas or prototypes, how are they, the students incorporated into any pending or future patents and commercialization efforts uh, or monetary returns? Yeah, so um, this is a bit outside of my expertise, but um, it's my understanding that it, at Wisconsin uh, there is a mechanism for um, producing patents. Um, and of course, everybody involved in the intellectual development and design of a new hardware, for example, would get credit. Um, anybody who's on board from the start to, in the design um, and modification and prototyping and optimization, um, of course, they'll be involved. And yeah, Wis University of Wisconsin does have a whole team of lawyers and pat people who are expert at patents to help with that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for your comments. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, we could go on and on. Such fantastic presentation, very exciting work. Really appreciate the participation of all of the panelists looking forward to additional research on ISS, additional results. Very exciting work in a lot of different disciplines. And uh, we really appreciate your participation in today's uh, session. Thank you very much. So um, 
uh, Jim or Alan, uh, are we Jim out? Jim or Alan, one of us. I think it'll be Alan mm -hmm. this time. And and thank you all so very much. I, I really do now understand a little more about how uh, students and then non-students get excited about this. I Sometimes uh, you, we've been in this a long time, you lose the excitement, but uh, seeing what's going on here, it really does bring back some of that, that old time excitement. So thank you all for the session. And now we're going to take a, a little break. We're going to wait until 15 minutes from now for the next session. The next session will be cell and microbiology results. And so uh, thank you very much. Take a little break.